Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's monthly webinar series. Today's topic is a step-by-step -step process to troubleshoot power quality problems. Uh, my name is Jamie Smith, and I'm the digital marketing specialist from Megger North America. And I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter and panelists. On the right side of your screen, uh, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. And you can submit questions at any time during the presentation uh, by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Uh, also, all webinar attendees will receive one PDH or .1 uh, CEU for attending. You will receive this in an email within two business days of the webinar. Uh, that email will also include a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and a link to a video recording of the webinar if you'd like to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. Remember, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation, and they will be answered at the end of the webinar during our Q&A segment. Uh, our presenter today is uh, Sanket. Bolar, uh, Applications Engineer for Megger. Uh, also joining our presenter at the end of the webinar as part of the Q&A panelists are Andy Sagel and uh, Dinesh. Uh, and uh, Andy Sagel is a Megger product manager and Dinesh is uh, the technical manager. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, Sanket. Thank you, Jamie. So in today's presentation, before we get started with the presentation, let's go over the agenda of the presentation. We have the following points that we are going to discuss during the course of this presentation. We are going to start off with the theory. So we are going to go over some of the power quality phenomena that are typically observed. Then we are going to discuss the basic steps involved in a power quality problem evaluation procedure. Then we are going to look at some of the key steps or some measures that you need to take to ensure a good power quality survey. Then we are going to look at the settings that you need to make on the power quality recorder itself so that it records useful information. Then we are going to look at the data assessment part. So we're going to see what you need to do, what kind of analysis can be done on the data that you retrieve at the end of the recording. Let's get started with the first section of the presentation. So there are different types of power quality phenomena like short duration variations, long duration variations, transients, voltage fluctuations. We won't cover all of it, but we'll spend a little bit of time discussing some of the power quality phenomena. Let's start off with short duration variations. RMS variations which occur in the duration from half a cycle to a minute are classified as short duration variations. There are three categories of short duration variations, sags, swells, and interruptions. Based on the duration, they can be further classified into instantaneous. Instantaneous variations have durations from half a cycle to 30 cycles. Momentary variations, durations could vary between 30 cycles to 3 seconds. Temporary variations, uh, the duration could be between 3 seconds to a minute. Effects that short duration variations have, uh, most prevalent effect is equipment shutdown. They can lead to process disruption. Uh, swells can also cause component failures in equipment. Let's look at the first category of short duration variations, SAGs. A SAG is defined as a decrease in the RMS magnitude of voltage or current. Causes of voltage SAG. Voltage sags can occur due to sudden increase in loads, sudden increase in currents. So switching on of loads, starting of large motors can lead to voltage sags. The term dip is used instead of sags in IEC standards. Now let's look at a sample waveform of a sag. You will see, if you look closely, you will see that for about three seconds, there is a decrease in the magnitude of the signal. Now that's an example of a sag. Let's look at the second category, which is swells. 
A swell is defined as an increase in the RMS magnitude of voltage or current. Causes of voltage swell, switching off of loads, switching on of capacitor banks. So swell is kind of an opposite of a sag. Let's look at the waveform capture of a swell event. If you look closely again, you'll see that from the third cycle onwards, there is a slight increase in the magnitude of the signal. The third category is interruption. Interruption is defined as a decrease in the RMS magnitude of voltage or current to less than 0.1 PV, which means that the RMS goes down below 10%, then that's classified as an interruption. Causes of interruptions, interruptions could occur due to faults, due to equipment failure. Now this is a graphical representation of what we have discussed so far under short duration variations. So on the x-axis you have the duration of the event, on the y-axis you have the typical voltage magnitudes that you observe. For example, for instantaneous swell, the duration could be anywhere between half a cycle to 30 cycles, and the typical voltage magnitudes that you would see uh, for the event to be classified as an instantaneous swell would be 110% to 180% Right. So that was short duration variations. Let's get into transients. A transient is a quantity which varies between two consecutive steady states during a time interval which is short when compared to the time scale of interest. So the duration is shorter. So unlike in case of short duration variations where we looked at the RMS values, in transients we look at the instantaneous values of the signal. Transients can be classified into impulsive and oscillatory transients. The, the main effect is they cause insulation failure. They, they can cause component failure in electronic equipment. They can also cause nuisance stripping breakers. Impulsive transients. Uh, an impulsive transient is a sudden non-power frequency change in the steady state condition of voltage, current, or both that is unidirectional in nature, in polarity. It could be either positive polarity or negative polarity. Uh, causes lightning. Lightning causes an impulse surge. <coughs> Let's look at the waveform capture of an impulsive transient. If you look closely, you'll see that the transient uh, is really thin, and it coincides with the with the, uh, with the tick mark on the graph. If we zoom further, we can have a better look at that transient. To give you a perspective, the duration of the pulse is just 60 microseconds. So you need you would need a recorder with a very good sampling rate to be able to capture impulsive transients. Oscillatory transients. Oscillatory transient is a sudden non-power frequency change in the steady state condition of voltage, current, or both. That includes both positive and negative polarity values. It's classified into low, medium, and high frequency based on the frequency. Causes. It could result from capacitor switching, capacitor energization, ferroresonance in transformers. This is a sample waveform. If you, if you look at the second cycle, you can see uh, variations. Now let's get into waveform distortion. Waveform distortion is defined as a steady state deviation from an ideal sine wave of power frequency principally characterized by the spectral content of the deviation. It includes harmonics, interharmonics, DC offset, noise, and notching. For the, during the course of this presentation, over the next few, few slides, we're going to look at harmonics and interharmonics. So let's get into harmonics first. Harmonics are sinusoidal voltages or currents having frequencies that are integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. Fundamental frequency is the system frequency. So 60 hertz in the United States. In that case, the harmonic frequencies would be multiples of 60. So 120 hertz, 180 hertz, 240 hertz, 300 hertz, 360 hertz, so on and so forth. They're classified as harmonic frequencies. There are odd multiples, there are even multiples. Odd multiples are called odd harmonics. Even multiples are called even harmonics. Sources of harmonics. Harmonics mainly arise from nonlinear loads. So loads of whose impedance varies with voltage, uh, loads which 
draw current only for a portion of the voltage cycle. Total harmonic distortion is the term which is used to quantify the harmonic content. If you look at the formula, it's the square root of the sum of the squares of the ratios of all the harmonic orders with respect to the fundamental. For an accurate calculation of THD, uh, at least the 50th order harmonic uh, is required, uh, is recommended by the standards. Total demand distortion is the term which can be used uh, for currents instead of THD. The reason being that for currents, unlike voltage, there can be a lot of variation. A current can be really high or it can be really low. For really low currents, even if the harmonic content, if, even if the harmonic currents are low, the ratio of QH to Q1 could be really high. And that could result in a high value of THD, which may not necessarily be an accurate representation. So the term total demand distortion could be used uh, instead of THD. The difference between TDD and THD is TDD uses the maximum rated current or the maximum current measured over a demand interval as the fundamental. Effects of harmonics, they lead to overheating. Uh, they can also lead to resonance conditions. So these are some sample waveforms of harmonics. Uh, this is the current drawn by a computer. If you look at the red waveform, that's the current. You can see that it's severely distorted. And on the right, you have the harmonic spectrum, which shows you the harmonic content. You can see that there are a lot of odd harmonics in the current. Uh, the magnitude of the harmonics decreases with increasing uh, order. This is the sample current drawn from a, a drawn by a half HP motor. Uh, you can see that it's slightly distorted because of the presence of third harmonics. This is the current measured on a variable frequency drive, a six pulse drive. Uh, you can see that it has a lot of fifth and seventh harmonics. If you look at the harmonic spectrum. Let's get into interharmonics. Interharmonics are voltages or currents having frequencies that are not integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. So all the frequencies that lie between harmonic frequencies can be classified as interharmonic frequencies. So a frequency like a 210 hertz, 300 hertz, uh, I'm sorry, 330 hertz, uh, something that is not a multiple of 60 hertz here could be classified as an inter interharmonic frequency. Interharmonics mainly arise out of any process that involves uh, frequency conversion. So cycloconverters, static frequency converters, uh, induction furnaces, arcing devices can also uh, create interharmonics. Effects, interharmonics can interfere with PLC signaling. PLC signals are high frequency low voltage signals which are transmitted over power lines uh, to remotely turn on or turn off appliances uh, among other things. Uh, interharmonics are also high frequency signals so they can be misinterpreted as PLC signals. They can interfere with the process. Uh, they can also induce flicker in CRT devices. Voltage unbalance. Voltage unbalance is defined as the condition in a polyphase system in which the RMS values of the line voltages and or the phase angles between consecutive line voltages are not all equal. It's evaluated in terms of symmetrical components in IEC. So you have positive sequence components, negative sequence components, and zero sequence components. In a perfectly balanced positive sequence system, you would have only positive sequence components. Uh, there would be no negative sequence and zero sequence. But when you have unbalance, you, you have a little bit of negative sequence and zero sequence. And the amount of unbalance is measured in terms of the ratios of these components with respect to the positive sequence component. So you have the negative sequence factor, which is the ratio of negative sequence to positive sequence. Zero sequence factor, which is the ratio of zero sequence to positive sequence. The traditional method of looking at the deviation from the average is not preferred because it does not take angular contribution into consideration. It also gives you unpredictable results if harmonics are present. A little bit of voltage unbalance can lead to a 
large amount of current unbalance. Current unbalance could be as high as the cube of a voltage unbalance. Uh, an unbalance of one person or less than one person is considered desirable. Uh, unbalance of less than two person mainly results out of single phase loads on a three phase system. If the unbalance is greater than two percent, it could be because of blown fuses uh, on a phase of a three phase capacitor bank. It, uh, if it's really high, it's greater than five percent it could be because of single phasing conditions. Effects, like I said, voltage unbalance causes current unbalance, which in turn leads to overheating. Voltage fluctuations, uh, small magnitude fluctuations in voltage having uh, different frequency levels, uh, which are continuous in nature, can lead to flicker. Flicker is the impression of unsteadiness of visual sensation induced by a light stimulus whose luminance or spectral distribution fluctuates with time. So to put it in common terms, it's the uh, changes in the brightness of the lamp that you can experience because of fluctuation in voltage. Voltage fluctuation is the phenomenon here and flicker is an undesirable result. There's a whole standard dedicated for flicker measurement that's IEC 61000-4-15. It details the steps uh, of, the, of the process that's involved. Uh, basically what it does is it looks at the voltage, it scales it, and then uh, it uses the transfer function for uh, describing the relation between the lamp and your eye and your brain to, to change the voltage fluctuation into instantaneous flicker values. Those flicker values that are obtained at the end of the process are then analyzed statistically to calculate the short-term flicker value. The observation period or the period for calculation of short-term flicker values is 10 minutes. Uh, you can look at the, you can see the formula on the slide there, the terms P0.1, P1S, P3S, P10S, P50S are the flicker levels exceeded for 0.1%, 1%, 3%, 10%, 50% of the observation time. A level of uh, a PST of 1 corresponds to a level of irritability for around 50% of an observation group subjected to flicker. PLT is long-term flicker. It's calculated from short-term flicker values. A typical aggregation period for calculation of PLT is 2 hours, which means it would use 10, uh, it would use 12 10-minute uh, short-term flicker values to calculate one long-term flicker value. Long-term flicker is generally used in compliance studies where uh, the variation, the fluctuation voltage has a longer duty cycle. Now that we have covered some theory, let's get into a power quality problem evaluation. So in this section, we will go briefly go over the steps which are typically involved in a power quality problem evaluation procedure. So you have the first step which is identifying the problem category. You will see some symptoms. Based on those symptoms, you can try associating them with certain problems. You could also set the power quality recorder to record some information to help you find out uh, what the problem is initially. So it could be because of unbalance, could be because of sag swells, flicker, transients, harmonic distortion. Once you have identified the problem, you need to characterize the problem. So get more data on the problem. So you place the power quality recorder for a longer duration, get more measurements, collect more data, find out what uh, find out what's causing the problem, find out the characteristics of the problem, what effect the problem has on your equipment. Once you have characterized the problem, once you have enough information about the problem, you would look at solutions. Where can solutions be implemented? At the utility side, at the customer side, on the transmission system, distribution system, end use customer interface, on the customer system, uh, on the equipment which is displaying the problem. You identify all the solutions available and then you evaluate them. 
So you do modeling, you analyze each option, evaluate all the options that you have at hand. And then you go with the best option. Typically, economics plays an important role in deciding which option is the best one. So these are the five steps involved in the procedure. And what we'll be concentrating on is the first two steps where you will know, uh, where you'll see how to go out there uh, and how to get the best data uh, out of your recording so that you can characterize the problem effectively. Key steps for a good power quality survey. So if you take some measures before you go out there uh, and start the actual recording, you'll be able to get very useful information which would help you characterize the troubleshoot the problem effectively. The first and foremost thing and the, the most important thing is you need to know why you're going out there. It could be for troubleshooting. So if you want to find out incompatibilities between equipment and the source, power quality evaluation, if you just want to do an estimation of the electrical environment, if you want to develop a power quality baseline, planning the connection of new equipment, if you want to uh, look at the future performance of, a, of an equipment or some power quality mitigating devices. So you could have various reasons for conducting a survey. It's important that you know exactly why you're going out. Because the other parameters that we're going to be discussing in the next few slides depend on the objective of the survey. Monitoring locations. Once you've figured out why you're doing the survey, you decide on where to place the monitor. So if you're looking at a particular equipment, you want the recorder to be as close to the equipment as possible. Because you want the recorder to see exactly what the equipment is seeing. For a general power quality investigation, on the other hand, you could place the recorder at the customer service entrance, which is the point at which the utility feeds the plant or the facility. Cost and convenience play an important role. It's always easier to measure at a low voltage system than on a high voltage system because of reduced transducer costs. It's always more convenient and less expensive to measure at a substation than on a feeder or a pole. Point of common coupling is a common term uh, in the field of power quality is defined as uh, that point on a public supply network uh, where one or more loads nearest to a particular load where other loads could be connected. So as you can see on this diagram, you have the utility supplying electricity to a bus, you have a transformer in between. Uh, the bus to which the secondary of the transformer is connected is served as the point of common coupling as the customer that's under study is connected to that same bus as the other bus. Now let's look at some suggestions for monitor locations. Like I said earlier, if you're looking at a particular equipment, you want the monitor to be as close to the, uh, to the load as possible. So if you have a power conditioning device, then the monitor would lie between the power conditioner and the load. If you want to look at what effect the power conditioner has, you would place the monitor in between the power conditioner and the sub -band. If you want to look into harmonics, you would place the monitor close to a capacitor. If you want to do a general assessment of the plant, you would place it at the customer service entrance. Before you actually go out there, you want to uh, do a survey of the site. You, you want to find out as much information about the site as you can get. So use single line diagrams, use load specs, transformer specs, drawings, um, any and every information that you can find about the site, you need to have it in hand before you actually go out there. Changes in installation topology, any recent changes that may have happened, status changes, transformers being taken in and out of service. Known disturbing loads, so if you have any loads in your vicinity that you feel they may impact your measurements, you need to be aware of. 
any operations, big operations that may be going on in the facility at regular times, regular intervals of time, uh, you should be aware of. So in summary, you need to get as much information about the site as possible on, on the customer side as well as on the utility side. Quantities to measure. Based on your objective, you need to know what quantities you need to measure. So if you are looking at overheating, you know that it might be because of unbalance or harmonics. So that should be top of your priority list. On the other hand, if you're just doing a load study, uh, you should you need to look at the power parameters. You're not really concerned with some other parameters. So based on your objective, you need to come up with a priority list of parameters that you want the recorder to look at. Uh, it could be something like power on one, then two it could be sag swells, three it could be transient, uh, four could be flicker, fifth could be harmonic, so on and so forth. So you could you need to come up with a priority list based on the objective. Get as much data as the recorder can provide, and then use what you need. If you have a sophisticated recorder which gives you all the data in the world, that's good for you. You need to capture as much information as you can. Uh, and then you can discard what you don't need later. That's always the better way to go than recording some data and then realizing that you didn't you needed some other type of data. The decision to come up with a priority list is affected by instrument storage capabilities. So if your instrument has a small storage, has memory limitations, then you want to uh, come up with a priority list and that kind of limits your options. Monitoring thresholds are very important. If you're looking at a particular equipment that you know about, uh, then it's easier to set the thresholds. Uh, you can set the thresholds just below the susceptibility limits of the equipment. For a general power quality survey, uh, it may not be that easy to set the thresholds. Uh, the thresholds need to be set at an appropriate level. So by that what I mean is if you set the thresholds too tight, uh, it may result in excessive triggering. You may capture a lot of events, a lot of information. Not much of it would be useful, however. If you set the thresholds loose, on the other hand, it may result in events not getting captured at all. So you have the two far ends, and you want, you want the threshold to be somewhere in between. One way to go about it is set the recorder, set, set tight thresholds on the recorder, and set the recorder to record for a short duration, maybe for a half an hour, or until you get a certain number of events. Then take the recorder out, go over the data, and you'll get an idea uh, on how to set the thresholds in that data. You can set the thresholds and then put the recorder back there for a longer duration record. These are some suggested threshold settings given in IEEE 1159 uh, for 120 volt loads. You can see that the SAG limit is at minus 10% of the nominal swell is at plus 5%. Uh, the transient limit is approximately twice the nominal. Uh, voltage TSD is at 5%. Uh, voltage unbalanced is at 2%. All right, so let's look at the monitoring period. Depending on the type of information, uh, you would need to set the monitoring period. It also depends on the frequency of occurrence of problems. If there's a problem that repeats itself uh, every week, then you need to set the recorder on the side uh, for at least a week. Rarer events like SAG swells may need longer assessment periods. Uh, some other steady state information like harmonics can be easily assessed over a shorter period. IEC 61000-4-30 uh, has uh, recommendations for minimum assessment periods for various parameters. Monitor placement is another important point. You want the monitor to be connected securely. You don't want it to fall off. You don't want the connections to come loose. 
it should not pose a safety hazard to those working in the area. So uh, preferably it should be inside an enclosure. That's not possible if it's going to be out in the open. You want to place barriers so that people don't run into it. Should not pose a safety hazard to the person installing the monitor. Sometimes the spaces are too tight. Uh, the person may not be able to make the connection safely. External factors like temperature, humidity, RFI also need to be considered. Uh, these equipment are microprocessor based. They can be easily affected by changes in temperature. Uh, the circuits are really small, so the impedances, clearances, they can be affected if the temperature exceeds the critical limit. Humidity, uh, excessive moisture can result in condensation, which will lead to corrosion, uh, could cause shorting, arcing. Dry air, on the other hand, can lead to static discharge. RFI can also interfere and cause erroneous data generation. The monitor should be sturdy, it should be able to withstand vibrations and mechanical stresses. Any sort of mechanical shock can lead to loose connections and then arcing. Grounding of the monitor is also important. If you have the power supply grounding connector, uh, you have a ground sensing lead uh, which connects to the ground of the system being monitored. If these two ground points are not at the same potential and if the power supply grounding connector and the ground sensing lead are connected internally to the chassis, then you can have a ground loop. The ground loop can result in noise, it can affect measurements. So you want to make sure that you don't have a grounding loop forming. You can, what you can do is before you start the recording, you can gently tap the ground sensing lead on the ground of the system being monitored. And if a spark occurs, it means that the grounds are a different potential and uh, there's a grounding, a grounding loop would form. So we looked at all these points and these are, these are some key measures that you need to take to ensure good uh, data collection uh, so that you can go over it later. Uh, you can get useful information if you take these steps. You can have a successful power quality recording. Now let's get to the next section which discusses the, the settings that you need to make on the recorder. If you take all the steps that we have covered so far and you come up with the, you program the recorder, you don't program the recorder properly, then there is no uh, point in following all the, all the steps that we have discussed because uh, if the setup file is not, uh, is not set right, then you would get wrong data out. You won't get useful information out of your recorder. So it's very important to set the recorder to record, to give you the information that you need, to give you useful information. So let's go over all the points, uh, all the, 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 the steps that you would come across while setting up a power quality record. Configuration. Remember when we were looking at pre-monitoring site surveys, I told you that you need to get as much information about the site as possible. Uh, this includes the configuration of the system. So is it a Y-connected system? Is it a delta? Uh, is it an open delta? Is it a three-wire system? Is it a four-wire system? You need to know the configuration of the system that you're connecting to, and you, you need to make the connections accordingly. The current and voltage ranges, selecting an appropriate current range is important because current uh, varies over a wide range, so you want uh, if the current range is too high, the resolution would be, uh, would be low, resulting in inaccurate results. If the range is set low, then the CT could turn to saturation, uh, which again would result in inaccurate results. So you want to set the range at an appropriate level. You want to be close to the maximum current that you expect to see during the recording. The process of connecting the CT is also important. Polarity uh, should be right, and also the frequency response of the CT should be adequate if you're planning to analyze harmonics. Monitoring thresholds, this is also a point that we uh, went over earlier. Uh, this is what you, you could typically see on, your, on the software of your recorder. Uh, you see multiple limits for different types of events. You need to set those limits for the events that you want to capture. 
size and you want to set the limits at appropriate levels. Time intervals is important. So there is a measurement interval and there is a storage interval. A measurement interval is 0.2 seconds for class A measurement devices, which means that every 12 cycles or every 0.2 seconds uh, it's going to calculate, it's going to measure an RMS value. And the storage interval is variable. It, you, can, you can change it as per your applications. So uh, for high resolution measurement, you want to keep the storage interval at the minimum. So for a class A measurement device, that would be 0 0.2 seconds. For a general PQ data analysis, you can you can keep it at three seconds or ten minutes. Uh, if you change the storage interval to a higher value, let's say if I keep it on ten minutes, what happens is it's going to measure uh, uh, RMS values every 0.2 seconds, and then at the end of the ten minutes, it's going to look over all those 0.2 seconds value 0.2 seconds values captured over the last ten minutes. It's going to come up with a minimum value. It's going to come up with a maximum value going to come up with an average of all those values. Waveform capture, you can also set the recorder to capture waveforms every time there is an event. So you can program the number of cycles that you want the recorder to capture. Pre-trigger cycles are the number of cycles that occur right before the start of the event. The trigger cycle is the cycle in which the event is triggered. The post-trigger cycles are the number of cycles that occur that immediately follow the start of the event. So for example, with this setting, if an event occurs, I would get 13 cycles on my sweep. So two pre-trigger cycles, one trigger cycle, and 10 post-trigger cycles. Now over the next few slides, we're going to look at some different power quality scenarios. We're going to look at the settings, that uh, the typical settings to deal with those power quality problems. So if you are experiencing motor overheating, that could be because of current unbalance, uh, harmonics. So you want to enable the unbalance. You want to look at the harmonic content. Nuisance breaker tripping could arise because of transients. So uh, sudden changes in current, so you want to look at the swell limit, you want to look at the sub-cycle limit. Component failures could arise from transients, so you want to enable the sub-cycle limit, set it at an appropriate value. Neutral overheating could be because of triple end harmonics, which are uh, multiples of third harmonics. Uh, could arise because of unbalance in the system. So you want to enable the unbalance. You want to look at the THD. You want to look at the harmonics. UPS switching on and off could be because of transients, uh, loose connection, load switching. So again, you want to look at the transients among other things. So on all of these pages, you have all these settings, and I'm not going to be spending much time on these slides because you have uh, the, the copy of the presentation will be made available to you later, so you can go over these settings later. Uh, switch gear equipment failure, again, could arise because of transients. If you want to look at the subcycle limit. Voltage swells could also cause uh, computer problems, could be because of harmonics or transients. So you want to look at the THD subcycles. So now that we have covered, uh, what we have covered so far is we, we went over the theory, then we looked at some steps that you need to take before you uh, actually think about doing the recording. Uh, then we actually talked about how to program the recorder to give you useful information. We looked at some typical settings that you see uh, for different that you could have for different power quality problems. Now let's look at the next part, which is data assessment. If you have a sophisticated recorder and if you program it right, it will give you all the information 
it will give you uh, a lot of information and it will give you a lot of good information. But if you don't know what to do with that information, then uh, you will be at a disadvantage despite having the best record. These days there is a lot of things, there is a lot of analysis trending that you can carry out on the data that you get. Uh, we'll go over some of the things that you can do. Uh, this session will mainly look at uh, captures from our software uh, to show you uh, what kind of trending, what kind of analysis can be done. So the first slide, for example, you can do steady state analysis. So analysis of steady state parameters like voltages, currents, power parameters. Uh, the first slide, you're looking at the, uh, the RMS values of the three phases in a three phase system. Uh, you can see that the three, phase, the three voltages are pretty close to each other. If you look at the scale, you'll see that there is actually not much variation in the voltage. Now, earlier I talked about minimum, average, and maximum when I, when, when I was uh, on the slide that I did time intervals. Talked about measurement interval and storage interval and how it calculates the minimum, average, and maximum. Uh, this is an example uh, of the trending of minimum, average, and maximum uh, parameters. So I took the voltage B uh, values from the previous chart and uh, I used the data uh, for voltage B values and I have this trending chart of minimum, average, and maximum. You can see that average and maximum don't vary much. If you look at the minimum value, it drops drastically on a couple of occasions, which means that for a little bit the voltage dropped uh, and the duration was so small that the average value didn't really get affected by the minimum value. This is a trend chart of the current RMS values. So unlike voltages, uh, current, there's going to be a fair bit of unbalance there. Uh, you can also, instead of looking at charts, you can look at reports. So this is one example. You have the table there, which gives you the minimum values recorded for different parameters, different voltages and currents, different phases. You have the maximum uh, readings recorded for different channels. You have the RMS values for the whole duration of the recording. It tells you at what time, on what date uh, those values were recorded. Now if you look at the minimum value for BB, and that corresponds to the, to the fluctuations that we saw in the previous slide, uh, the minimum voltage on the B phase occurred on 31st of May at 1.32. Uh, if you look at the corresponding maximum current on the uh, B phase, you'll see that the maximum occurred on the same time. So it was essentially one one event that occurred, the voltage, uh, the decrease in voltage because of the increase in current. The second table, sorry, the second table you have the uh, vector information where you look at the phase relations between voltage and current. In this slide, you can trend, you see a trend of power parameters. If you see the load is cyclic in nature, uh, it kind of repeats itself. It follows a pattern after a certain interval of time. If you look at the surges in the demands, those surges occurred at 9 a.m. This data was captured from a mall. Uh, so I guess the mall opens every day at 9 a.m. Now, so far we were looking at analysis of steady state parameters. Now let's an, uh, look at what kind of analysis can be done on RMS variations, short duration variations like uh, SAG, SWELCH. You can, uh, you can get everything in a tabulated format. So here you see a table in which it gives you the different types of events, how many events occurred, on what channels, so on the columns, you have the different types of events. You have SAG, swells, THD, sub-cycle, phase deviation, fast transients, rapid voltage check, main signaling. Some of those events we did not cover in the theory section. Some of those we did. Uh, on the rows, you have the different voltage chan uh, channels and the current channels in different phases. Let's 
let's look at waveform analysis. So this is an example of a waveform capture of a tag event. Uh, we, we saw one of these earlier as well in the theory section. Now this is a waveform capture. You can program it to capture a certain number of cycles, pre-trigger, post-trigger, and you can uh, look at the instantaneous values on the waveform. You, it will tell you for how long the event lasted. It will tell you the exact date and time, what type of event it was, on what channel it occurred. Uh, it also gives you the information on all the other channels when the event occurred. Analysis of sub-cycle events, EFTs. EFTs are essentially impulsive transients. Uh, now this is an example of a, of a transient event. You can see on the third cycle there, are, uh, there, is, there is a disturbance. Uh, again, it gives you the date and time. It gives you the type of event on what channel it occurred. It gives you the duration of the event. PhD values can also be trended. This is an example of the trending of uh, voltage PhD values. The values are three point something, so it's less than uh, five percent, or eight percent. Harmonics analysis can also be done. You can take uh, different orders of harmonics and you can trend them. If you look at uh, all these figures on the right, on the top right, you have uh, uh, the different harmonic percentages. So you have third, fifth, seventh, and eleventh. All of them are colored differently. If you look at the figure on the left of it, you have the training chart. The colors correspond to the different orders. The green one is for the third, uh, for the fifth harmonic. The blue one is for the seventh. The red one is for the third. Uh, the black one is for the eleventh. So you can see that this particular capture has a high fifth harmonic content. If you look at the harmonic spectrum, you'll see that the fifth one is, is quite high. Uh, and uh, the capture that you have below is of, uh, of the waveform that's, that's being analyzed in this, this slide. If you want to look at higher order harmonics, uh, if you want to get everything in a table, you could take one cycle and you could analyze it using past four year transfer methods. To, uh, to come up with the, uh, with the different orders of harmonics. In this, this particular slide, you can see up to 63rd order harmonics. You can also calculate K factors. Data can be analyzed as per standards. Uh, the standards specify certain limits, like for example, this table, you're looking at the, tape, uh, the, the limit specified by the European standard EN50160. Uh, based on those limits or based on your own custom templates, you can analyze the data to give you a kind of snapshot of the recording that you have done. Uh, to go over a little bit uh, about this, the, there is the green line that you see, that's the narrow band limit. The white band limit that you see is the 100% limit. So, uh, the narrow band limit is, according to EN50160, it's set at 95%, and the wide band limit is set at 100%. The 95% uh, means that 95% of the data needs to be within the narrow band limits, which are kind of tighter thresholds for certain uh, for parameters. Uh, and 100% of the data needs to be within wide band limit, which is the, the loser thresholds that are suggested in the standards. So you have uh, different types of instruments based on the nature of the problems. You can use various instruments to deal with those problems. If you have wiring and grounding problems, uh, you can deal with those using wiring and grounding testers. If you simply need to measure voltages or currents, you can use multimeter. There are different types of multimeter, the peak responding multimeters, uh, average responding multimeters, true RMS multimeters. Peak responding, look at the peak values and calculate the RMS value from the peak value. Average responding multimeters, look at the average values and calculate the RMS values from the average. Uh, true RMS, actually look at the RMS value of the signal. Uh, if you want to capture waveforms, you can get oscilloscopes. If you want to analyze uh, transient sacks or swells, you can get disturbance analyzers. If you want to analyze the harmonic content in a system, you can get harmonic analyzers. 
combination of disturbance and harmonic analyzers are also available in the market. Flicker meters can be used to measure just flicker. If you want to look at power parameters, you can get energy monitors. So there is a whole range of options that you have. You have a whole range of weapons in your arsenal. And based on the type of battle that you have in hand, you can pick the weapon of your choice. For example, if you want to look at the phase rotation of a system, you can get a phase detector. If you want to look at the multi, uh, if you want to just measure voltage, you can get a multimeter. If you want to check the quality of the grounding, you can get a grounding resistance tester. If you're looking for something a little more sophisticated, you can get uh, a power quality analyzer. Uh, this is Mega's latest offering in the field of power quality called the MPQ2000. Uh, these are some of the features of this instrument. It's a class A measurement device. Uh, it's an, it has the auto CT identification uh, feature on it, which means uh, that the CTs that are provided with it uh, as accessories, uh, the unit detects the CT ratio on the CTs and it gives you a message uh, if there is a mismatch in the ratios on the CTs and uh, the ratios in the setup file of the recorder. It's powered off the phase A, which means that it doesn't require a power outlet. It derives its power from the system to which it's connected. It supports SD cards. Uh, uh, memory is not a limitation here. Uh, configuration verification. It gives you a verification message. It, it gives you a warning message if you hook it up wrong, if the connections are not made as per the configuration on the setup file. Uh, ingress protection level is IP54 with the lid closed. Uh, onboard data analysis. So uh, remember in the, in the last slide of the previous section we discussed data analysis as per the standards. Uh, that can be done on the unit itself without you having to download the data from the, to the computer. These are some of the screenshots from the graphical user interface on the instrument. So you have uh, the vector relations on one screen. That's really important. By looking at this screen, you'll be able to uh, kind of ensure that the connections are made right. Here, the one on the left is the error message. So if you hook up a CT backwards, it will tell you that the CT is connected backwards. And the one on the right is from the onboard data analysis screen. So, during the course of this presentation, what we did is we went, went over the theory a little bit. Then we looked at uh, the basic steps involved in a power quality problem evaluation procedure. Then we, uh, we looked at some of the steps that we need to take to ensure a good power quality monitoring service. And then we looked at how to program the recorder to give us useful information. Uh, we looked at all the steps involved in setting up the recorder. Then we looked at some typical settings for different power quality problems. And uh, then we looked at the data assessment part. So what do you do uh, after you get the data? How do you analyze it to, uh, to give you what you need? So these are the, with that I conclude my presentation. These are the sources that I use for my presentation. Now Jamie is going to take over. Uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. All right, thank you, Sanket. At this time, the webinar is officially concluded. Um, but before we begin the question and answer session, I'd like to share with you a, a feature article and cover story uh, by Mega Cable Application Engineer Jason, uh, Jason Sushak that was released this month in the newest edition of uh, the NIDA World Journal. And the title of that article is Improving System Reliability with Offline PD Testing. Um, you can uh, please be sure to just subscribe to the Needle World Journal uh, so you don't miss this article and other informational content in the future. Uh, we'd also like to make you aware of an upcoming webinar uh, that will be presented by Dennis Moon, training instructor at AVO Training Institute. Uh, that webinar is going to be next month. And uh, the title of the webinar is Protective Relays uh, in the Power Delivery System, How It All Fits Together. That'll be on July 25th uh, from uh, 1 to 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. And um, 
the uh, PowerPoint that we uh, email out to everybody that's attending today, there will be a link to that, uh, that webinar as well in the, the PowerPoint if you'd like to register for it. Okay, let's go ahead and take uh, 30 minutes to answer as many questions as possible. We have already had a lot of questions come in already, um, but if you still have any questions, uh, please feel free to submit them and we'll try to get to as many as possible in, in 30 minutes. Also, uh, for those that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on the screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon uh, future webinars. Uh, also, a copy of the presentation will be emailed to uh, everyone in the next few days along with a video recording. And uh, you'll be able to view, uh, view the video recordings of previous webinars and our upcoming webinar schedule uh, on our website at us.megger.com backslash webinars. All right, now let's get to some of your questions. The first question we have um, is actually going to be for our panelist, Andy. Uh, is it possible to have current distortion and not have voltage distortion and vice versa, or do both uh, usually occur? Actually, it's uh, very common to have current distortion uh, because on a nonlinear load, what's going to be happening is uh, the nonlinear load will only draw the current at the peak of the waveform. This increases its efficiency. So normally, when you look at your current waveforms, you're going to see a lot of distortion in them because of the nonlinear loads drawing these current at the peaks of the waveforms. Now, typically, you may not see this on the voltage. The voltage may look good. It's actually the current harmonics that create your voltage harmonics. As your current harmonics get larger and larger, they will actually begin to pull down on the voltage and create a distortion in those. One of the common ones that we see comes from uh, third harmonics is that you may look at a voltage waveform, and instead of it being nice and a nice sine wave, you'll see it, a flat top on it. That is due to third harmonics. You get high currents, and they end up clipping the top of the voltage wave. So the currents cause the voltage harmonics. OK, thank you, Andy. Uh, next question is for uh, Sanket. Uh, why is single point grounding important in power quality? A uh, single point, if, if you have different uh, ground points with different potentials, that could result in circulating currents. Uh, and that, that's the main reason why single point grounding is important. And that, that's something that we saw earlier during the presentation as well uh, when, we, when we were looking at the grounding of the monitor. Uh, so you need to make sure that everything is uh, grounded at one single point and uh, everything is this, all the grounds have the same potential. All right. Thank you, Sanket. Uh, next question is for uh, our panelist Dinesh. Uh, why, why are some uh, or why is some equipment more waveform sensitive than others? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we know that there are just lots of different equipment that you run into, be it residential circuit or industrial uh, plants. <clears throat> The main reason why you would see the performance of a certain uh, equipment may not be similar to the other is that the way they are designed, uh, the way the tolerances are set in the, in the design criteria, how they are operating, what kind of load is connected to those, uh, those equipment, all those play a very important role in the effect of the input voltage waveform and whether it deviates from, from a sinusoidal signal and if there is any harmonics coming in into the system, different equipment will respond differently. And one other thing is that there are nowadays many, many electronic equipment uh, that are nonlinear in nature and those would be more sensitive uh, than, the, than the other ones. Uh, <clears throat> we, we see this all the time where uh, these new uh, electronic equipment are less tolerant and they are more sensitive to the input waveform. It just purely has to do with the way they are designed and the tolerances have been set. All right. Thank you, Dinesh. 
Uh, next question is for uh, Sanket. Is high neutral to ground voltage a clue to some sort of potential uh, PQ problem? Uh, sometimes uh, you could have a, a high neutral to ground voltage uh, if 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 the neutral is not it's, it's supposed to be grounded and still you get some voltage that could be a grounding issue. Uh, but sometimes uh, there could be a resistance could be deliberately added on the neutral. Uh, so if if it's supposed to be a grounded neutral and you get a voltage on the ground uh, on the neutral, then uh, that could be a problem. Okay, thanks, Sanket. Uh, next question is for Andy. Uh, aren't voltage and current transformers going to filter the PQ issues you're looking for? Um, part two, uh, assuming yes, how can you mitigate that problem? One of the most common answers in power quality is the word depends, and that's exactly the answer here, because it's going to depend on the bandwidth of the CT or the transducer that you're using. Uh, when you're in a substation application, for example, you may be hooking up to secondaries. When you do, typically those secondaries have limited bandwidths to them. So basically, uh, any information that you would get in, say, greater than about the 11th order harmonic is going to be extremely attenuated. So yes, it can filter that out. When you are looking at, when you're using the actual clamps that actually come with the monitor, those will have a bandwidth associated with them, and those bandwidths are usually much higher. So those can uh, measure your uh, harmonic orders well into the 50th and above. Uh, so again, that's going to be very dependent upon the bandwidth of the actual transducer you are using. So that's one thing to always check for when you're looking for power quality uh, analysis. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, next question, Sanket, is there any standard that tells required sampling rate? Uh, not as far as I'm aware of, but so there are different sampling rates for different events. Uh, for something like electrical fast transients, uh, which is an impulsive transient, you would need a very high sampling rate to capture that. Uh, something as high as one megahertz uh, would be good enough to capture EFTs. For normal RMS measurement, uh, like I said, for a class A measurement device, it's, it's 0.2 seconds. If you're talking about sampling rate, uh, typically 256 samples per cycle is good enough uh, for uh, to capture transients. Um, but I don't think, as far as I know, I don't think there's any sampling rate uh, mentioned in the, there's any limit for sa sampling rates mentioned in the samples. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sanket. Next question is for Andy. Uh, what would be uh, typical co typical causes of failing light bulbs, fridge and stove electronics, furnace motors? Uh, part two of the question, could harmonics be an issue in a residential home? Okay, this is, uh, this is a fairly in-depth question here. Uh, when we're looking at lighting systems, a lot of that's also, their failure modes are also going to depend on the type of lighting system, whether it's incandescent, whether it's a CFL, uh, whether it's a standard fluorescent, all these things will have an impact on those. Um, when you're talking CFLs and incandescents to really shorten their lifespan uh, is swells, current swells, uh, or voltage swells, rather. And they're very, they are very sensitive to their voltage. When it goes up, you'll see them, um, those, uh, they'll increase the lighting, they'll swell up, and it will decrease their lifespan substantially. When you're looking at the regular fluorescents, <coughs> they can be very susceptible to transients as well. Even the CFLs are uh, the transients. And you'll see that if you ever replaced one and you see little black dots in it, that's actually called mercury deposits, and that's a sign of transients. Transients can also cause damage to your electronics. All right? Furnace motors, now the motors, their big enemy is heat. Okay? As they heat up, you can have coils that overheat. They can end up reducing the lifespan, destroying the bearing. And I'm very familiar with the furnace motor. I just had to replace one. It's not a nice job. And uh, that heating effect can be caused by several different things as well. Again, voltage anomalies. If you're going, if the voltage drops low on a motor, that motor is going to maintain a certain amount of power. 
it's going to draw more current, more heat. If the voltage goes high, you could saturate the core, but more likely with a furnace motor, because it's turning on and off all the time, you're increasing your inrush current. So all these things can have an effect. Now, typical causes of these things, voltage regulation, poor ground, also solar tiles. Solar panels can be a big culprit here. A lot of people put in solar panels, but don't put in conditioning equipment or batteries or anything. So what happens is you can get overvoltage conditions that can lead to premature failure of motors. And solar panels also, um, they instant, their output will change instantaneously with the solar radiation hitting them. So you can get serious, very high frequency transients that come out of them. And those can also reduce the lifespan of electronics as well. So if you're going to be looking at this in a residential home, the things to really look at is your voltage regulation, high-speed transients, and also look at your harmonics as well uh, and uh, any unbalance that you may see. Those would be the things to look at. All right. Thank you, Andy. Um, next question is for Dinesh. Uh, what specific nonlinear loads could cause harmonics in a residential home? Uh, that's a very interesting question because uh, nowadays, uh, uh, if you talk to anyone, they want their home to be uh, smart, compatible, and energy efficient. But those energy efficient bulbs or, or lighting come at a cost because the way they make those energy efficient is that they don't draw power throughout the, the cycle of a sine wave. And by that, they, they consume less power, but at the same time, it results in being, them being nonlinear devices. So if you think about like fluorescent lighting, uh, these, uh, these new energy efficient bulbs, uh, uh, power, uh, power electronic devices like your, your computers, monitors, uh, your laptops that take AC but convert it into DC to, to power your laptop. Uh, anything that does not take power throughout the cycle of the sine wave, those are basically the contributors to your, to your harmonics. Uh, and as I mentioned that anything that uses switch mode power supply where they take AC and maybe converting that to DC, uh, uh, fluorescent lighting, uh, computers, monitors, uh, all those things are contributors or, or are basically nonlinear devices. And those nonlinear devices, when put in, 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 in service, they're going to take a nonlinear current and that would create harmonics. Okay. Thank you, Dinesh. Um, Andy, we actually just had another question that was uh, referring to your recent question that you just answered. Okay. Um, they, were, they were saying they didn't understand your answer on the harmonics in a residential circuit. They said on one hand, uh, CFI bulbs create PQ problems. On the other hand, uh, the PQ problems affect bulbs and cause flickering. So what causes what first? Bulbs create PQ issues or bulbs are affected by PQ issues? No, the bulbs are affected by the PQ issue what will end up happening is, like I said, with the CFL uh, bulb, that's going to be, those are very temperature sensitive. When they get higher voltages in them, they will heat up and they can burn out prematurely. Uh, you can also see when you get transients that come through the line, uh, transients are, uh, they will affect the lighting. And what you'll see is one of the things that's a telltale sign of a transient when it affects the lighting, when you see it in a fluorescent light, when transients hit that, one of the things that will happen is that it will leave what's called mercury deposits on the bulb, and you'll see that as little black dots. Now, normally, when you replace a fluorescent light, a bad one, you'll always see the dark ends, and you'll take it out. But if you see little dots throughout it, that's a sign of uh, transients on the system. And those transients on the system can also re result in damages to electronics, uh, 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 to your uh, standard electronics in your system as well. Okay? And when I mentioned harmonics, what I was mentioning there was that basically, again, with motors, um, their big issue 
is going to be heat, and that can be generated by unregulated voltages, or it can be generated by uh, harmonic content as well. Now, in a residential house, your harmonics are typically going to be um, third-order harmonics because typically most of the equipment's all computer equipment. So that will be the main one to look at. That will pretty much cause some. That can lead to some high neutral currents as well. Um, but as I was saying, in a residential system, a residential house, the real key things to look at are your voltage regulation. If it has solar panels, look for high-speed transients as well. And also, um, uh, to also always look for harmonics in any PQ analysis, okay? Because those can cause all sorts of problems with uh, inductive um, inductive loads. Okay, thanks, Andy. I hope that answered your question. Next question, uh, Sanket. What are the recommended uh, thresholds for a 220 volt uh, system? So there are two standards which make recommendations for thresholds. There is the European, which is EN50160. Uh, there is IEEE 1159. So you can apply either of those uh, standards uh, based on what, based on your choice. You can apply either of those standards uh, to your system. Uh, if you look at the limits, they are in percentages, so they can be applied uh, to a 120 volt or a 230 volt. Uh, you just need to change the nominal frequency. And also, you just don't need to follow the standards. I mean, you could come up with your own thresholds based on your applications, based on your situation. All right. Thank you, Sanket. Uh, next question is for Andy. How do you set up monitoring for TDD? Total demand distortion. <clears throat> Basically, if you look at IEEE 519, actually will call out uh, the recommended practice for uh, doing total demand distortion. Now, with THD, we're looking at the harmonic distortion on the voltage. And this is fine because typically when you look at it, you're measuring the T content of the THD as a percentage of the voltage. Now, we know the current doesn't always have to be there. So if you have a very low current, then you're, you can have a misleading THD. This is why we measure TDD. And IEEE will recommend using a interval of either 15 minutes or 30 minutes, using, uh, using that as your aggregation interval for your capture of your THD or your uh, total demand distortion. Um, what happens when you look at TDD is you'd have a uh, this information that's captured in 15-minute or 30-minute uh, periods, and it gets aggregated into a value. And what TDD does, instead of comparing it to the, the current value that was uh, at that time, it will look at the entire recording interval, and it will find the highest current the highest average current that was recorded during that recording interval, and it will use that as the reference voltage throughout the recording. This way, you don't end up seeing uh, harmonic distortion levels of 100 and 200 percent when the current was only at half an amp. So it always keeps a nice level uh, value. So when you look at the TDD, it's realistic looking. Now the other thing that you can also do is use your own reference value. Some utilities will have a common current reference value they'll use throughout their entire system. This way they can easily compare total demand distortion from one area to another. Okay, thank you, Andy. You're welcome. Next question is for uh, Dinesh. Uh, short of recorder data, are there any basic telltales of a PQ or harmonic problem that you could share? Okay. Uh, making sure that I understood the question right, uh, without recording any any PQ measurements, just by looking at the, the symptoms or looking at the problem, can I tell what could be causing that? If that is the question, I would say that depending upon what kind of problem you run into, you can make some guesswork, but obviously the best way to, to pinpoint that would be to capture the data. So for instance, if the 
if I am getting a nuisance breaker tripping, uh, then certainly that could be caused by by current getting too high, and in those cases the swell in the current or the increase in the current is what I would look after. Uh, if I notice that uh, that uh, that there is a certain section of the house that is getting flickering or that is getting like uh, uh, the, the light getting dim and all that, I might look at the flicker problem or I might look at the imbalance in the load because the rest of the house looks good only uh, a part of it uh, is having problems, so I might look at uh, some imbalance in the circuit. Uh, uh, if I'm having uh, my my computer data getting uh, getting uh, corrupted, then I might look at some sort of uh, transient problems because uh, these electronic equipment are very very sensitive to transients. So I might look for those ones. Uh, if you go to an industrial plant and they talk about the transformer getting heated up or uh, uh, they are having problems uh, with uh, with their lighting and uh, like more on the heating side, I would look at the harmonics. So just by looking at the kind of problem, I may have some pointers, but that's the extent to it. Uh, if you really want to know what's going on, the best thing is to to make as as Sankit pointed out. You make a assessment of the site, a find out what the problem is going on, and based upon that, you 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 record the data and kind of confirm your theory that you were thinking at first. All right, thank you, Dinesh. Uh, next question is for Andy. Are the clamp CTs that would be used to capture data designed to let high frequency transients pass through them? And in other words, are they specially designed for the instrument you are using for a PQ study? Well, this is also going to depend on what you mean by high speed transients. Um, if you're looking at transients up to about the 64 microseconds, then the, um, the CTs that we design, uh, that we supply with the unit will record uh, transients up around that area because what you're looking at there again is a matter of bandwidth. So if you're using a CT with a small bandwidth, again, high frequencies, you won't get through them. So again, it's always looking at the bandwidth of the CT to make sure that it will accommodate for the higher frequencies. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, next question is for Dinesh. Um, are newer breakers less uh, susceptible to tripping due to harmonic content, and do they sense RMS as opposed to peak sensing? Uh, I would start with this thing that I'm assuming the question is more on the low voltage circuit breakers, which are 600 volt and below application. If we are talking about that one, there are breakers out there that that they operate based upon calculating the RMS value and then there are breakers out there who use the, the peak value of the of the wave shape to determine the, the tripping criteria. Uh, if we talk about some of the breakers that are thermal magnetic in nature, in other words, there is a bimetallic strip that looks at the amount of the heating effect and based upon the amount of heating generated Based upon the calculation of the RMS current value, they, they, they look at the amount of heating generated and they operate based upon that. And now when you talk about some of the newer breakers that have an electronic trip unit on that, they, they may calculate the value uh, and kind of take into account the harmonics as well and then give you the value. And then there is a setting where you can define whether you want to trip based upon the peak value or the RMS value. But in, in all these cases, uh, it is highly dependent upon what, what you pick. RMS value would be, would be less problematic uh, when it comes to harmonics because you take the overall RMS value, but if you just look at the peak value, there are higher chances that you might trip uh, not at the right point because the, the peak might be offset by quite a bit 
because of the harmonic content. But again, it, it, it kind of, it, it's not a simple answer of yes or no. It depends upon what kind of breaker it is, what kind of trip unit that is there, uh, how they're measuring that. And sometimes even the, the breaker that, that, that take into account the RMS value, they may not trip at the right value. So it, 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 I know that, that answer doesn't sound right, but the, the, the honest or the true answer is that it depends upon the type of breaker and the trip unit. Okay, thank you, Dinesh. Uh, next question is for uh, Sanket. What are the levels of percentage, percent THD that start to cause problems in a power system? Uh, there are different limits recommended in the standards. Uh, if you look at IEEE 1159, and we had a screenshot of it, in the presentation, it is say 5%. Uh, if you look at the European standard, which is EN 50160, uh, it says 8%, I believe. Uh, so anything five, greater than 5% could start to cause problems, I would say. All right, next question uh, is for Dinesh. How do you deal with the monitor clock setting and the protective relay clock? And also, do you recommend to sync both clocks as part of the pre-monitoring site survey? Uh, that would have to do with what kind of uh, PQ survey you are doing. I always recommend, uh, there is a feature in, in the power quality analyzer that Megar offers where you can, you, can, you can start the recording at a defined time interval, uh, time period, and also you can do what we call as uh, clock hour orientation. and. Uh, the gentleman who asked that question, there, there was contact information at the end of the uh, uh, end of the presentation. They can reach out to us, and we can provide more information on what does clock hour orientation and what a schedule recording means. But there are ways that you can start the recording at a defined time interval, and that would help you in syncing with how the relay or any other device you want to sync with. Uh, so, so there are methods and ways around. Uh, it just depends upon what kind of recorder you have. All right. Thank you, Dinesh. Next question is for uh, Sanket. Not sure how inter interharmonics occur and can be captured. Uh, I thought the Fourier transform resolved the waveform into harmonic components, phase, and magnitude. What are interharmonics shown? So or where are interharmonics shown? So the concept is the same. Uh, by using FFT, uh, it breaks up the signal into different frequency components. And the concept for measurement of interharmonics is the same as that for harmonics. Uh, so the way it works is you have frequency bins. So for example, there are 15 hertz bins for frequency measurement. Uh, if you are looking at the 120 hertz component, then the bin would lie between 112.5, which is minus 7.5, to 127.5 hertz. So any frequency component that lies between 112.5 hertz and 127.5 hertz would fall under the 120 hertz bin and would be counted as the second harmonic. Uh, that's the same concept that applies to interharmonic measurements. Uh, for interharmonic frequencies, you would have interharmonic frequency bins of a certain bandwidth. And any frequency components which lie within the bandwidth be counted as that particular interharmonic. Okay, thank you, Sanket. Uh, next question is for Dinesh. I am having a problem with 200A pad mount elbows heating up and failing. What could be causing this? Uh, that is a, is a is a classic uh, example of without doing the recording. Uh, if I would have to guess what's going on. Uh, it, the gentleman mentioned that it's heating. Anytime there's a heating, I would look at uh, any kind of harmonic issue, any kind of o what this transformer is rated for and how much current is flowing that, in, that can cause that. Now, it is also mentioned that it's heating and failing. I would do a, a temperature scan or thermal scan of those elbows to see what's going on. And then, uh, if I don't have a, uh, a, a, a advanced recorder, the, the least that I would like to do is that I would take an amp probe or, or 
something that I can connect and see what is the current in each phase, in each phases. And if I see an imbalance in current, then imbalance could be the problem where one of the phase might be overloaded as compared to the other one. Uh, the, so to summarize, like it could be the, the imbalance, it could be harmonics, or we are exceeding the rated current of that, that specimen. Uh, so those could be the three initial, uh, 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 if I would have to say my, my, my analysis of that, those would be three things that I would start with. But doing a recording or uh, recording proper data for at least like two to three days, that would give you a better idea as what the root problem is. But I would certainly say that that look at those the options that I just mentioned. All right, and uh, another question for you, Dinesh. Uh, other than harmonics, are there more causes of uh, neutral overheating? Uh, this goes kind of on the similar track as the first question. Uh, uh, whenever you have neutral overheating, obviously one of the thing is the uh, is the harmonics, the triplet harmonics. Uh, but other than that, you can also run into uh, uh, imbalance uh, phases. That's one of the things that would cause the neutral current. Uh, the other thing that I would look at is that I would want to make sure that whether how much difference there is between the neutral and the ground voltage. If the neutral is tied to the ground, then that that is not a possibility. But I would look at any kind of floating voltage on the neutral with respect to ground. Uh, I would also uh, look at, as I said, like the imbalance, the harmonics, and any kind of uh, phase angle differences between the three uh, phases. Those would be the things that I would look at to, to kind of pinpoint from where this neutral overheating is coming. All right. Thank you, Dinesh. Uh, next question is for uh, Sankat. I think we have a couple just a few more minutes left. Hopefully, get to a couple more questions. Uh, then, Kit, can settings on the mega meter uh, be set ahead of time and stored on the device? Yes, that's the way it's done uh, with our meter. At least, uh, what you do is on the software you program the, you create the setup file. Uh, this, the steps, uh, the procedure is pretty simple. Once you've created the setup file, you save it. Uh, either you, either you program it directly on the recorder or you save it to the SD card and then put the SD card in the recorder and uh, download the setup file over there. So the settings are done ahead of time and then uh, you go to the site and just start the recording. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is for Andy. Uh, I believe we have a DC clamp to measure DC. Using the DC clamp, can we also measure the AC component using the same clamp? Typically, when you have a DC clamp, it's typically going to be a Hall Effect CT. And yes, you can measure the AC component using a Hall Effect CT. Um, the, just a couple things to note is that the range will typically be lower, uh, the maximum RMS range that you're going to measure. Uh, there's usually a setting on there, too, that you can select AC or DC. And uh, the other thing is just to check with any Hall Effect clamp is just to check to see if there is any... Um, inaccuracy uh, introduced due to temperature, because they can be temperature sensitive. But they are getting better with that these days. All right, thank you, Andy. OK, uh, last question. Uh, we're running out of time now. Uh, uh, Sanket, uh, in the setting of uh, MPQ 2000, I noticed the sag and swell limit for current. What is the application? So if you want to capture drastic changes in current, that's where you would use those those limits. For example, if you want to capture inrush current, you could place a swell limit on the current. If you want to capture sudden changes in load, you could you could have sag or swell limits uh, for the current. Okay, thank you, Sankat. All right, everyone. It looks like that's all we have time for today. Uh, we apologize if we didn't get to your uh, your question, but we will uh, definitely follow up with you offline. Uh, we just want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, we hope to see you again at our next webinar on uh, July 21st at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, the title of that webinar is Do's and Don'ts of uh, Insulation Power Factor Testing, and uh, that will be presented by Jill Duplessis. And uh, 
All right. Have a great weekend, and uh, please remember to answer the survey. Thank you.